Okay, so today we're gonna, or we're in a series where we're asking the question, what on earth am I here for? Why were we created? Why were we put on this planet? What is the purpose of life? And last week, Sue spoke about the main purpose, the, the, the number one purpose of why we were created, and that is that you were planned for God's pleasure. Okay, we were created to love God and to be loved by God. That, that's why we're here. That's the main reason we're here. And you know, God loves us so much that he didn't just stop there. There's another purpose that he created us for. And today, we're going to look at the second reason, the second purpose for this life, and that is that you were formed for God's family. God loved us so much that he put us into his family. In 1 John 3, verse 1, it says, See how very much our heavenly Father loved us, for he allows us to be called his children. And we really are. We are God's children. God created the entire universe because he wanted a family. He didn't need a family. He desired a family. And the, the whole story of the Bible is actually the story of God building his family. A family who will love him and honor him. And a family who can reign with him in eternity. Do you know, Reese and I got to a stage in our marriage where we just felt like we had more to give. Like we had more capacity to love. We wanted, we wanted to have a family. We wanted to have children to share in our life, to share in our experiences with us because we wanted to love and be loved to a greater capacity. And that's what God did. God wanted to love and be loved. And so he created a family. He built a family and we are that family. God created us so that we could be part of his family. Ephesians 1 verse 4 to 5 says that even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to him through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do and it gave him great pleasure. So when we place our faith in Jesus, God becomes our father we become his children, and other believers become our brothers and our sisters, and the church becomes our spiritual family. Do you know that every human being was created by God, but not every human being is a child of God, because it's through our faith in Jesus that we become his children. Galatians 3 verse 26 says, for you are all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 2 verse 9 so now you Gentiles, and Gentiles is just, it's anybody that wasn't a Hebrew or a, 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 wasn't Jewish, okay? So most of us would be Gentiles. He says, now you Gentiles are no longer strangers or foreigners. You are citizens along with all of God's holy people. You are members of God's family. So God's family is called the church, and we are called to belong to that family. We're called to belong to his church. Do you know that the word church in the Bible actually comes from the word that means called or called out? And so if you're looking at what does the church mean, it actually means a people who are called by God. You see, because the church is not, it's not an event. The church is not a program. The church is not this building. Okay, we don't... We don't go to church, we gather as the church because the church is a group of people who are called by God to live a life on purpose for him. So, what on earth am I here for? Firstly, to love God and to be loved by God. And secondly, to belong to his family. We are called or we are formed for his family. So today what I want to do is I actually want to look at a few different metaphors in the Bible. So there's a few different metaphors that God uses to describe his church. One is a family. The, um, God refers to the church as a flock. God refers to the church as a, a body. He, if I could find it in my notes, I'll tell you what the others are. Um, he refers to the church as a temple. Okay? And then lastly, as a garden. And so what I want to do is look at these five things. And if we can understand why 
God referred to the church in, in those ways, maybe we can understand a bit more about the purpose of the church or, or what the church is meant to do, what the church is, and how we fit into that. And the fact that the church was actually um, formed or the church was actually the purpose, one of the purposes of the church is, is actually to help fulfill our deepest needs. And so the first metaphor I want to look at is the church as a family. Okay, in a healthy family, you have a good identity. A healthy family help form who you are. It can, helps um, let or inform you of, or helps, to, it helps you to understand who you are. In unhealthy families, we have the opposite. Okay, we're, we're left trying to figure out who am I? Who, there's, there's insecurity. Okay, but today my first point is that in God's family, I learn my true identity. Okay, in God's family, I learn my true identity. And identity is so important, especially in the world today, where you can literally choose to be anything you want. And it actually causes so much insecurity and, and anxiety, because oh, I could be anything. I don't know what I want to be. No, God's already given you an identity. You don't have to come up with one. You just have to figure it out. You just have to figure out who, who God, who did you make me to be? And you figure that out in the family, in God's family. You see, if you don't have, if you have a good sense of who you are, you will be secure and you'll be confident. But if you don't have a good idea of your identity, you're going to be insecure. You're going to be constantly chasing success or constantly looking for affection, approval. You're going to need to approve yourself and, 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 and um, find success somehow so that you can make something of yourself. You can be someone. But the good news is you are already someone. You are already loved. Like how amazing was that song this morning? I am chosen. I am wanted. I am loved. You belong. The, the, the word is full of identity, of God saying this is who you are. This is who I've made you to be. And it's all good. And, this is, and when we come here, when we gather as the church, as the family of God, when we connect in life groups and we discuss God's word and we, we pray together, that's where our identity becomes more secure. Did you feel encouraged after that song this morning? Come on, that's what it does. You're invited to come to church, to gather as the church so that our identities, we can discover, we can figure out who are we really? Because if we don't do it here, we're going to look for it in the world. Yeah. And the world is going to try to tell you, oh, you need to drive a nice car to be successful. Or, hey, you need to wear the right clothing to be successful. If you can, if you can just eat at these types of restaurants or arrive in this kind of outfit or be around these kind of people, or maybe you have to ha be married or you have to have children, you have to do this, then, you know, then you've achieved something, you've arrived. That's what the world's going to tell you, but that's a lie. Yeah. Because God says you don't have to do anything. You don't have to achieve any trophies. I already love you. You're already loved. You're already wanted. You're already chosen. You can rest in that. But unfortunately, so often, we end up prioritizing our lives around what the world says is successful. And yet, if you look at the, the people that the world says are successful... Yes, they have money. Yes, they, they have a title or yes, they have fame. But look at their families. How many of them have loving, life-giving relationships with their children? How many of them have marriages that are filled with security and love and, and are, are, are helping each other grow and become better people? And yet we look at them and we say, that's success. That's what I want. And we prioritize our lives chasing that putting our time and our effort into to working harder and making something of ourselves. And God says, yes, yes, you must work hard. Yes, you must try and add value to this world. But just make sure that we prioritize the things that are meant to be prioritized, which are relationships, and especially those in the faith. As you know, none of that stuff will last. I think of the floods in Durban and how houses were just washed away in a second. They had everything. Life was great. And then, boom, everything changes. Nothing is eternal other than relationships. 
the only thing we can take to heaven one day are the relationships that we formed with those who believe, those that are part of this family. It's the church, the family of God that'll be in heaven one day. That's what's eternal. That's what matters. And our, all our deepest desires are fulfilled in our relationship with our heavenly father and our place in his family. Every time we meet together, we're actually surrounding ourselves with the truth and building into our true identity. Your most important position in life is, in, is your place in this family of God as a son or a daughter of the king and a brother and sister or sister in this family. Hebrews 2 verse 11 says, So now Jesus, the one who makes holy, mm, the one the, and the ones he makes holy have the same father. That is why Jesus is not ashamed to call them his brothers and sisters. You see, the Bible says that Jesus is the firstborn of many brothers and sisters. We, we get to be part of God's family. It also says that we get to take part in his inheritance. We get to share his inheritance. We get to be co-heirs with Christ. That means that it doesn't matter what we achieve or don't achieve in this world. It matters how we love, and it matters how we, how, how we our relationship is with God, how we love God and love people. That's all that matters. And if we can focus on that, we can get, get good at that, we're gonna get to heaven one day, and we're gonna share in a reward that's gonna last forever, that cannot be broken, cannot be stolen, cannot be destroyed in a flood. There's an inheritance that's worth living your life for, that's worth putting in the time and the effort and, and prioritizing. And that can only happen through relationships. It's relationships with God and our relationship with people. So let's prioritize our lives around gathering with the family of God, where we encourage each other towards our true identity. Because in God's family, I learn my true identity. And I just want to take a moment to also just encourage you that the thing that identifies you as God's family, okay, well, first it says your love, but you know how some families have like a plaque or I know like Scottish, fam Scottish families are big into that, like this is your family, that's your family, and you've got this heritage. <laughs> I, don't, I don't have that. Um, <laughs> even, even gangs will have, you know, they'll put like tattoos on them to say, and if you notice someone, you're like, oh, I know, I know what gang you belong to. Do you know what identifies us as the family of God is baptism. That's what shows. So that doesn't, you get baptized into the family, but that doesn't mean Baptism doesn't make you part of your family. Your faith in Jesus makes you part of the family. But baptism shows others that you are part of this family. It's saying, I'm not ashamed to be a part of God's family. I believe in Jesus, and I want to be a part. I want him to place me in a family. And so I really want to encourage you, if you've never done that, no matter how long you've been a Christian for or how short you've been a Christian for, if you believe in Jesus, your next step is to be baptized. And so you can sign up on a Connect card. There's a QR code that you can scan, or you can go to the Connect area after the service, put your name down, and get baptized. Join the family. Okay, wear the, wear the badge that says, I'm a part of God's family. Okay, so I want to encourage you to do that. Okay, the second metaphor that God uses to describe the church is a temple. 1 Corinthians 3 verse 16 says, don't you realize that all of you together are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God lives in you? Ephesians 2, 20 to 22 says, together we are, are his house, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. And the cornerstone is Christ Jesus himself. We are carefully joined together in him, becoming a holy temple for the Lord. Through him, you Gentiles are also being made part of this dwelling where God lives by his spirit. He's talking about the church. The church is, is, being, the church is being joined together to make this temple, to make this building, this dwelling for God. It's not this building, it's this building that is the temple of God. Okay, do you know it takes thousands of pieces, different pieces to build a building. 
We recently built a flat in two years. It was awesome. <laughs> Not. Woo, I don't ever want to build anything again in my life. Okay, I didn't physically build it, but it was still happening around me. Um, it's very stressful. But it takes so many different pieces, and all the pieces have to fit exactly right. Otherwise, there's leaks, which happened. Okay, or <laughs> there's, there's problems if things don't, aren't cut right, and you try to put it up, and there's a gap. It doesn't reach. That's not going to be a support. If you have lots of different pieces, but they're not actually connected, the wind's going to blow, and that whole thing is going to fall down. But you need every part to be connected exactly where it's meant to be, and then the building is supported. Like we have these amazing pillars right in the middle of our hall. We love them. <laughs> we would love to get rid of them. But unfortunately, if we get rid of them, this whole building will cave because they are supporting the structure. And the church is referred to as a building where when the parts fit together, when the parts touch, they're connected, they're joined, they actually become the building of the, the temple of God. But unless the parts all fit together, that, that building won't stand. My second point is that in God's temple, I'm supported by others. Okay, in God's temple, I am supported by others. What I've also noticed on a construction site is that there's always lots of stuff lying around. So when you drove past our house for the last two years, you could see it was a construction site because there was piles of sand, there would be pieces of wood lying in the, I mean, you went into the flat, there was just stuff everywhere. And what, I, what, what stood out is that you can, you can have a pipe or a piece of wood in the building, but unless it's connected to the building, it's not a part of the building. So if you've got extra bricks lying around, if those are never actually put into the building, they'll never be a part of the building. They're eventually gonna be taken out with the rubble or taken to another construction site, but unless that part is connected to another part, it won't form part of that building. And so as a church, we can come in the building, we can be sitting in the building, but we cannot be a part of the building. Okay, unless you are connected to another part of the building and there's a joint and it's connected, then you become a part of the family, then you become a part of the building. You have to be connected to belong to God's church. Attending church services does not mean you are connected to his church. The great news is that when you are connected to God's building, you are supported by others. Because in God's temple, I am supported by others and I become a support for others. In God's temple, you are not alone. Okay, there's so many people here that want to connect with you. They want to love you. They want to support you. They need you to be a support to them. But you've got to take that first step of actually getting connected. In Romans 1 verse 12, it says, When we get together, I want to encourage you in your faith, but I also want to be encouraged by yours. As a church family, we are we have a mutual relationship. We're meant, God, God wanted us to gather lots with each other so that we could encourage, I can encourage you and you can encourage me. I can't tell you how much being a part of this family has meant to, to my marriage. Well, firstly, to me personally. Secondly, to my marriage. Thirdly, to my family. And then to friendships. Okay, I am supported in this church when um, Reese's dad passed away quite a few years ago, and it was quite a shock because it was um, a hit and run, and we were in hospital for a few days, not sure what was going to happen. Do you know where we got our support from? From this building, from this temple. People messaging, people phoning, people praying, um, and even other, other family members that are part of God's body just messaging us scriptures all the time that were just so encouraging meeting up with people, having dinners delivered to our house so that we didn't have to worry about cooking. We are supported in this house. When I'm raising three kids, I'm not doing that by myself. Oh gosh, I couldn't do that by myself. <laughs> okay, I need so much wisdom, but, and I've got that support in this family. I can go to people and say, 
listen, I don't know what to do. This is happening. Tell me, you've been there, you've done that. Give me wisdom. Where, where can I go to in the word? How can I encourage me? Okay, there's support here. But I'm supported because I'm connected. I'm only supported because I'm actually part of the body, part of the, part of the temple, part of the building. Okay, there is support here for you and there's a place for you to be supported, but you need to take that first step of getting connected. And so if you want to get connected, maybe you have been attending for quite a while. Maybe you're sitting here and you don't actually know anyone else around you or you've got no connection to the actual body. I want to encourage you to take that step before you leave today. Okay, you can sign up um, for Growth Track. Growth Track is our, what you would call a membership course. What we, where, where you find out a bit more about the church, our vision, our mission, and decide, okay, is this, is this the, the flock? Is this the, the body that I want to be a part of? And then you get connected to it. You join a life group or you join a team. Maybe you have done growth track, but you still haven't actually connected or taken a step. I want to encourage you to sign up for a life group. Okay, sign up for a team. Take just one step. Or maybe you actually just need to go to the connect area and talk to one person. Maybe that's your first step today. Just, just go, say hello. I promise you they're all friendly. We, we are very strict on who we allow in the connect area. Okay, they undergo a massive um, like interview process before we let them on. They are the friendliest people we have in this church. They're, they're lovely. I promise you, they're amazing. So go, go and just say hi. Get to know one person and they'll help you to figure out what your next step is. Okay. Thirdly, the, dis- the third description of the church in Scripture is that of a body. Okay, Romans 12 verse 5 says, Just as our bodies have many parts, and each part has a special function, so it is with Christ's body. We are many parts of one body, and we all belong to each other. So to Paul, who's writing this, being a member of a church actually meant being a vital organ to a living body. He's saying you're not just replaceable, indispensable. You're like being a part of, of church is actually being a vital organ in a body, a living body. Because the church is not is the church is a body, not a building. The church is a organism, not an organization. It's living, it's breathing because it's made up of us. And he's saying, we all are part of that body. And so thirdly, in Christ's body, I discover my unique value. Okay, in Christ's body, I discover my unique value. For the organs of your body to fulfill their purpose, they must be connected to the body. Okay, and the same is true for you as part of Christ's body. You were created for a special role, a special place. But unless you're connected to the body, you can't form that function. It's like saying I've got an eye over here in my hand. Is it of any use? It can't see. It can't actually do its function unless it's placed in the body. Okay, the same if I had an ear lying on the table. (laughs) It's pretty gross, but, (laughs) you know, it can't actually do. It's it's a great ear. It's perfect. But unless it's actually connected to my body, it cannot do its function. It cannot fulfill its function. It has to be connected to my body in, in order to hear, in order to play its role in the body. And so it's the same with us. We have a role to play, but we have to be connected to the body in order to play that role. I like how Eugene Peterson puts um, the scripture that I just read. He paraphrases it in the Message Bible, and he says, in this way, we are like the various parts of a human body. Each part gets its meaning from the body as a whole, not the other way around. We find our meaning, our value, who we are from the body. The body we're talking about is Christ's body of chosen people. That's the church. Each of us finds our meaning and function as a part of his body. But as a chopped off finger or a cut off toe, we wouldn't amount to much, would we? You cannot be who God made you to be without a church family, without being connected to Christ's body. You can't fulfill your purpose on your own. You were formed for God's God's family. When God made you, he already knew. 
He was going to place you in a family, in his family, and there you'll flourish. There you'll discover what your purpose is, what your, what your identity is, and what your value is, where you can add value. You are invited to be connected. You are invited to belong. Okay, the difference between being a church attender and a church member, we actually prefer the word partner because I think you can sign a membership form and never actually be a participating member. We like the the idea of a partner, okay? So the difference between being an attender and a partner is commitment. Attenders are spectators from the sidelines where partners or members get involved in the ministry. Attenders are consumers. We come to get what we need and we leave. But members or partners are contributors. Attenders want the benefits of a church without sharing the responsibility. Okay, we're a family. Family shares the responsibility. We all play our role. We all take part. My, my kids, okay, the little one's only two. He doesn't do anything. But the others, oh, I mean, he does a lot, but none of the, he doesn't take any responsibility, okay? <laughs> and so if you're a new believer, like, Okay, we're going to love you until you get to a place where you're ready to take some responsibility. Okay, but my six and seven-year-old, they take responsibility as part of my family. They make their beds with lots of fighting. They make their beds. Okay? <laughs> they empty the dishwasher. They, when we bring the groceries home, they help unpack the groceries because we're a family. Okay, we're part of a body. We take responsibility for the body. We don't just, we don't just consume But it's only when you're connected to the body that you can discover your unique value. God has a purpose and a plan for your life. One where you get to add ridiculous value to the world around you. Do you know that we we are making a difference in this community, in people's lives, daily, weekly, and you're invited to be a part of that. Okay, you're invited to help shape destinies, and you're invited to leave a legacy. And so you're in, I want to invite you today to be a part of this body. Let's say if you're not involved, if you don't know what your, um, what your gift is or, or what your, how you can add value, join Growth Track. Sign up for Growth Track. You're going to discover how you can fit into this body. And then but then that's not the, start, the end. You actually need to get involved. You need to start adding value. And as you do that, you'll discover more and more of who God made you, why he made you, how you can get, get involved. And then you're going to look back on your life and you're going to be like, what a legacy. What an incredible life we've lived together because we were all part of the body together. Okay, the last, the last one, which, oh no, it's not the last one. Wow. Okay, you guys are going to miss out on half of the sermon. I'm so sorry, (laughs) but it's fine. Okay, this is going to be the last one now, is the Bible talks about the church as a flock. And you might think, oh my gosh, I'm a sheep. I don't really want to be a sheep. I want to be a lion or, I don't know, maybe something pretty like a a peacock or just not a sheep. I mean, (laughs) they're pretty bland animals, right? But there's a reason that God refers to us as sheep. And that's because they're dependable. Dependable? No, dependent. They're dependent animals. Okay, they need a shepherd. And I love that Jason read, um, because I was going to read it and it saves me time, now is um, Psalm 21. We, We are called sheep because we have a good shepherd. Do you know that if a sheep is left to itself, it can walk off a cliff. It could walk right off a cliff. Because they need shepherd. They need a shepherd to guide them, to, to keep them um, in the flock. When I, before I gave my life to Jesus, I made such stupid decisions. Guys, I was like a sheep walking. Like it was destructive. Completely, completely destructive. If I didn't find Jesus, I don't know where I would be, but it wouldn't be in a good place. I would have been over a cliff. But because of Jesus in my life, because I have a good shepherd... He has placed me in a flock. He's placed me in his flock. And because I'm in his flock, I am protected and I am cared for. So the fourth point is just in God's flock, I'm protected and cared for. 
John 10, 11 says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd sacrifices his life for the sheep. We have a shepherd who's given us everything. He provides for us. He leads us. He guides us. He feeds us. He protects us. But he also places us in a flock. Okay, a shepherd doesn't allow their sheep just to roam free. He keeps them together in a flock, in a flock not a frock, in a flock, because <laughs> they are safe, they are protected, they are cared for in the flock. And so our Heavenly Father, our Good Shepherd, places us in a flock together. Life is so much better when we allow Jesus to lead us and guide us. In God's flock, I'm protected and cared for. So God protects us because He's our shepherd. He leads us. He also places us in a church family where there's leaders and pastors that can help lead and guide and protect you. But then He also calls us to look after, to stick together. Okay, sheep stick together. We are called to care for each other, to love each other, to protect each other. Do you know that in the Bible, the phrase one another is used 58 times? Okay, it says love one another, care for one another, help one another, encourage one another, support one another, pray for one another, love one another, greet one another. Over 58 times. Okay, we can do what we can and we pray for you guys and we love you guys and we, I mean, if you could just see our prayer meetings, we pray for you by name. As God brings people to our mind, we pray for you and we care for you and we work hard to put structures in place in order to... Um, to channel you in the right direction towards growth, towards where you're going to have a life of meaning and purpose. But you need to choose to actually walk that way. And we can only do so much. Then together, you have to come alongside each other and love and support each other. Galatians 6 verse 2 says, share each other's burdens and in this way obey the law of Christ. Galatians 6.10, therefore, whenever we have the opportunity, we should do good to everyone, especially to those in the family of faith. Ginger, our second purpose is actually all about learning to love others. God wants his family to be known for its love more than anything else. I want to just end with this last scripture in Romans 12 verse 9. It says, don't just pretend to love others. Really love them. Hate what is wrong. Hold tightly to what is good. Love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. When you get to the end of your life, you're not going to call for your diplomas. You're not going to say, hey, let me see my bank balance. I want to see how well I did in life. Oh, okay, I'm good. I can die now. No, you're going to want the people around you. You're going to want to hold on to people. You're going to want people to be close to you because that's what really matters. And so I want to just encourage you today. Let's focus on what, what's important. Let's prioritize our life around God's family, around the purpose that we were created for. The very reason we live is because we were formed for God's family. And my question for you today is what one step can I take today to connect with another believer? What's one, one step I can take? You might all be in different places. Maybe you've been in this church for, for ages, for years, and you've got lots of relationships. Well, maybe, maybe what's one thing that you can do to, to grow in your intimacy with those friends, with those people that are around you? Or maybe it's to say, hey, who can I let into this group? Okay, in this church, we don't do clicks. We're open. Maybe you need to have a look and say, is there anyone here that I actually need to connect with? Not for me, but for them. Okay, or maybe you haven't been here so, that long. You've been attending for a while, but you've never actually formed friendships. You never formed relationships where you're actually becoming a little bit more vulnerable. You're sharing a little bit more of who you are, allowing people into your world. And I want to encourage you, don't, don't just leave, don't just attend, but get connected. Join a life group or everything. If you want to know more about anything, you can do that on our Connect card or you can go and chat to one of those super friendly people in the Connect area. Okay, in closing, do you want to just stand with me and I'm going to pray, I'm going to pray for you. Pray. 
God, thank you that you connect us to a family. Thank you, God, that we don't have to be alone. You, you have chosen a family for us. We have you as our Father, our loving, loving Father, our shepherd who guides us and leads us. And then you've chosen a flock for us where we can be a part of life-giving relationships. God, I ask that you would help us to get through our insecurity. Or maybe it's, it's fear, Lord. Help us to, to step through our fear. Or maybe we've been hurt before. God, help us to be brave. Help us to trust again. God, help us to take one step closer to you and closer to relationships because it's in your family that we're going to grow. It's in your family that we're going to find out who we really are, who you made us to be. It's in your family where we're going to be cared for and loved. It's in your family where we're going to be protected. And so, God, I just ask that for every single person watching online or you know, standing here today, Lord, I ask that you would help each of us to recognize where we're at and how we can take another step closer to the destiny that you have for us, which is that we are formed for your family. God, we commit our lives to you as our shepherd.